seems to be a lot of interest in milkweeds lately, and so what what do you think is what what is so special? I've been trying to think about that the last couple of hours. And we, I mean, they they host monarch butterflies. What else? I mean, anybody? What do you want to hear about milkweeds? Anything? What do you think? Well, Availability. They're very toxic. Mm -hmm. They're really interesting plants to photograph because they have strange looking flowers. Yeah, well, that's one thing. I mean, I, I was thinking to me that it's a very unique flower. It is. It's a very unique way of getting pollinated. They are really, some, some of them are really beautiful flowers. Um, you know, there's a, there's something about milkweeds that just it seems like it's just interesting to study. And they're very, they're, they're bearable. I mean, I think they're habitat specialists too. Yeah. 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 But, so I, I guess I thought I'd maybe I'd start off with a little bit of explanation on some of my prairie roots. I mean, I worked for many years in uh, Barbersville, Oklahoma for Phyllis Petroleum, and that's up in north of Tulsa, which is essentially in northeast Oklahoma, it turns out, that's really the biggest expanse of tall grass prairie remaining in this country. I mean, there's thousands and hundreds of thousands of acres that are still up there. But and I guess about 33 years ago, I, be I became a birder. Um, I started trying to figure out how to identify birds. I started listing, creating my own bird list, and everything that birders do. So, but I like to bird in my own backyard. So within a few minutes of Barbersville is prairies, anywhere, any direction you go. So I, I, I actually wound up spending hundreds and hundreds of hours driving section line roads and walking out through the, my favorite prairie patches. And it may be that is what really taught me how to observe prairies. I mean, you know, because just walking through the prairies, you know, this, the, the grass is this deep. You don't know what you're going to flush. It could be a, a bittern. Harrier, a shorted owl, you know, Henslow sparrow, Lacoste sparrows, wrens, uh, you know, so it was something about that anticipation. And I, so, you know, I came to Houston in the early 90s and, you know, I, I was still doing bird sort of studies there, but I also mm -hmm. joined the Native Plant Society. And I went on some of the, you know, the field trips, particularly if it was a prairie involved, but I didn't really. You know, Dr. Brown was over here identifying the little plant, but I tended to be photographing the insects. But I think really what started me seeing all the plants in this prairie was the Psalms Prairie. I don't know, I think most people here know what Psalm Prairie was. It was a big, I don't know, it was 100 acres or more. It was just on the west side of town, and they cleared it all to build. You know, we, we were thinking we might could save it, but they, they cleared it to build Greenhouse Road. And just seeing that query was really opened my eyes. I mean, it, I didn't, you know, you, did, you don't really don't think that all of Harris County, all of this whole area was once a prairie, and there's very little of it remaining. And beyond that, it's really more diverse and than almost any other prairie, progress prairie in, in North America. So. Anyway, uh, tonight, I, you know, what, and what interests me is really that knowledge of trying to link, you know, and you know, milkweeds to their habitat and our heritage, really, and that's some of what I want to talk about tonight. And I'm, I'm going to talk about identification of some but I'm going to keep it really simple. You know, talk about habitat. You know, is it a wet? Does it like wet? Does it like sandy? Does it like rocky? Does it like forest or a prairie? Most of them are prairie plants. Um, and then, and of course, our heritage, what was it like maybe 100 years ago? And I will actually talk to maybe a little bit at the end about gardening. I know that's probably what a lot of people are interested in. So, in a lot of my uh, references is this um, Biota North America program. That's the, I use that for the range maps that I'll show. And that's the basis for this, you know, according to that uh, database, there's 77 species of scopes in the United States. There's 
36 in Texas, and there's about 15 in the Houston area. Probably, this shows 12 species here. That's really the, probably the ones you can find, but there we'll get, and I'll try to cover all 15 to some, to some extent. And I will not be covering this one. I mean, that's, most people, you know, that's all they know is, you know, you mentioned milkweeds and they're thinking of that plant. Is that what included in the numbers? No. I just. So those are the ones native to the United States, not just found in the United States. Right. All of these, all the other ones are native. You know, and I'm trying to define what is native to the Houston area, which is the Harris and surrounding counties. Yeah, but is that uh, tropical milkweed native to the United States? I don't think so. No. Some people might argue that. I don't think so. Okay. What about South Texas? Yeah. It's certain, it, it has been probably growing somewhat wild, maybe even in the Houston area for many, many years, perhaps. It's kind of fuzzy, but um, this is one of the main um, sources of information that I uh, use for developing a lot of this information. And this is uh, a, a publication that the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department came out with this year by Jason Singhurst and Ben Hudson and Walter Holmes. And they they just treat all of the species in Texas like this, where they just they talk about the habitat, distinction characteristics, and some other information. I mean this is example page. And actually this is one I'm not gonna talk about, the sand milkweed. And I don't know if anybody it it, it it's 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 supposed to occur not, it's probably, you know, a lot of these milkweeds um, like sandy conditions, like this one. So there's these sand, sand hill situations in some of the savannas. So I don't know if there's, it may be a pondo that may be as close as that, but may be some situation or something. I'd like to see this. You know, because this, this is probably Jason. He says, you can't read this very well, but he says, it smells distinctly like bacon cheeseburgers from a distance of 500 meters. I just want to talk some about the, our heritage, our prairie heritage, because it's really, I think, closely relate, related to the milkweed. Because most of them, not all of them, most of them are related to our prairie plants. This is one of the best, um, you know, prairie, tall grass prairie maps I've seen. Uh, this is what it used to be like. I mean, there's almost nothing remaining uh, today, but it's, I mean, anywhere like this map. I mean, so, I mean, in other words, at one time all of Iowa was the prairie, and today it's all corn prairie. But, but the coastal prairie is not even shown on some maps as part of the tall grass prairie, but it yeah. was a significant part of the tall grass prairie. And there's some interesting maps. On. This is this came from that Wild of North America project website. They got some interesting maps there. I couldn't. They didn't have one for Asclepias, but this one is native, you know, grasses species and how how many there are in different places. And so here is the highest concentration of native grasses. So it really is, speaks that our coastal tarax prairie is really the most diverse, probably of any. So we're here in Harris County, and we're, this is the eco region for Texas, and so we're mostly Gulf prairies, but, but also we're, you know, we're the northern sections, you know, in Liberty and Montgomery counties, and then Harris County is Piney Woods, and then there's uh, the, you know, the post of Savannah, they call it, that's in the Maybe comes over to Montgomery and over there kind of too. And we're not very far from the Black Hand Park, so just to get oriented. And this is another map. Uh, this is a soil survey map for Harris County. I just thought it was interesting because they describe, I can't read it, I guess, but all of the light green is described as prairie soils, and all the you know, yellow is prairie soils. It tends to be you know, somewhat. South of I-10, it's more of a strictly 
black clay and then north by 10 it's a loamy clay situation. Um, so here is the list of milkweed that I want to sort of try to cover quickly tonight. But also this is the habitat descriptions <coughs> from that pamphlet, the PWD pamphlet describing the identification of milkweed. So I just went in there and checked, you know, if they mentioned something, I put it on this list. So you can see that most of them are associated with our coastal prairie. There's a few that are not. But they're either associated with prairies or savannas. Only like this is a variegated red green. It's um, it's more of a forest species, a piney wood species, and in Texas, I've seen it like it in Katy Prairie out there once. But it's described more in the coastal savanna and piney woods. So it's it's less associated with our coastal prairies, and, and, and anyway, these highlighted ones are not necessarily our coastal prairies. Specific. Okay, just a little bit on this unique flower situation and how they're pollinated. Um, the, usually we talk in terms of they have these hoods, and associated with the hoods there's horns. This horn comes out of the hood. Now, not all uh, milkweeds have horns. Some of them have just hoods, and, and sometimes it's not hard, easy to recognize that they're a hood. And then the petals, and sometimes they they're, they are straight down the stem, the pedestal, and sometimes they're out, or sometimes they they curl up. And then there's this stigmatic slit here, and there's this uh, thing that so a, a pollinator insect. Well, it is put in, in here, or even a hair or something like that, and it'll pull out this, this thing here, and it'll attach to the insect, and it carries it to another plant somewhere, and it, that's the way it, uh, it pollinates, it gets pollinated. Yeah. So this is a, this is not a milkweed that's found around here. This is found in Oklahoma, and I, I was, this is in the Tauris Prairie Preserve in Oklahoma. And uh, well, I, I had this photo that sort of illustrated these flower park through up. So this is a long, longhorn beetle. This eats the milkweed, so it's not a pollinator. So it probably doesn't do the pollination. <laughs> so like here's a bumblebee. It's a classic one that, uh, and wasps and bees and everything visits milkweed. Milkweeds are one of the best. You know, nectar plants, I guess, because you just see all sorts of things visiting all, all kinds of nectar. So this is one of those, hmm. one of those lambs that was packed with one there, and there's some down here. If you take pictures of any insects on milkweed, you'll probably, you'll probably see that. I guess this milkweed is very poor. And most all milkweeds have seed pods that look something like this. Um, most of the time they're upright, and almost all milkweeds, the seeds are have these, you know, fluffy hairs associated with them, so the wind you know, disperses them. And almost every milkweed you see too has these milkweed beetles, mm -hmm. uh, milkweed bugs. This is uh, kind of the early stages of the next plant. Okay, so the um, the different species, and so I gave this talk, this sort of preliminary talk, a few months ago, and it was it, I didn't realize it, but there's a, there's confusion between these two species, and so there's uh, Asclepias. Incarnata swamp milkweed, and that's a common milkweed that is, you can buy the seeds and propagate it a lot, and it, you, you can tell it doesn't look too much different than this one. This is perennial, 
product of people. So I realize there's a lot of confusion about the justification of these two. Quantic mobility is uh, it's, it's, I've seen it in the roadside ditches in Missouri and Chambers County. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. seen it other places. Fort Bend. Be in Fort Bend County. Shield and yeah. yeah, and it's also, but it's really, if you read about the habit, it's like a bottom of the harvest forest. I've seen it down at yeah. Gulf Coast of Berks, Detroit, actually in practically in the woods. And really, it lacks wet areas, but it's it maybe not. And I think uh, Jason sort of said, you know, it's described as a coastal prairie pothole, but I don't know if I've ever seen it in a prairie. Uh, so, but I've seen it in open places on roadside ditches and stuff. So it can seem like a prairie species, but it's um, and also they, Jason says that it's it's heavily defined in Texas, even though it's not too uncommon to see it in Chambers and Missouri County. So if nobody finds it in other counties, is it Sheldon? Yeah. So I don't know. He, he says, you know, they want to know about the population. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that they were describing it as, as something that's really declined a lot. And this is the, uh, very similar looking swamp milkweed. And it's really found more in the uh, hill country. And I got these photos from Jason Singhurst, you know, and it was taken on the land of the river. But there's this one record for Brazoria County. <laughs> and I never, I, I have not been able to figure out what the basis of that record is. You know, sometimes, you know, Specimens get deposited in maybe herbariums and not identified for decades, and, and maybe the you know the location where it was collected may be a mistake. But I'm I'm personally I'm doubt right now I'm doubtful <coughs> that this occurs in Houston area. So. Um, what's the uh huh. What's the legend for the colors of the various counties? Um. Uh, well. The, if it's this light green, that's that's a record that it, it exists there. And if it's a yellow, it's sort of like it's sort of existed, but it's considered really rare. Now, why some of them show up as yellow and some don't? I don't know. I mean, I've seen in some species a, a, a green spot somewhere, and it, you know, you look it up, and it hadn't occurred there for 150 years. So. <laughs> But if it's colored in, you know, the, the, yeah, the light color, it means that it's, that's its range. So does that represent a herbarium record? I don't know. Yeah, every one of yeah. those is represented by a herbarium record. Joe said yes. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been able to locate that one. I've looked at, I looked at some. The U, University of Texas, I've looked at them, and I've looked for the LSU and 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 some of them, but you know, it, it, they're not all, and there's not one really database you can go to as far as I can tell. What is the brown? What? The, the brown? The dark yellow? These, these colors? No. No, they are. Mississippi. Mississippi.
And when these are, basically when, these, when this furnace blooms, it's just white. I, you hardly ever see any red on it at all after it's blown. And the other thing is that for a pot perennis, the, uh, the seed pods hang down and there's no tufts of hair or anything because it's, it's designed to, I guess, fall into water and get dispersed that way. Oh, wow. Whereas the swamp milkweeds, the, the seed pods stand up like a lot of milkweeds and they're, they've got tufts of hairs. I just wanted to show that this is one of the best milkweeds for, for gardens and attracting monarchs, especially in, in the fall. It bloom, It has a pretty long bloom time, but this, this is Tweedy's Wildfires of Houston, and he, he made a special point of saying that this is um, a great a plant for feeding the, milk, the monarchs in their, in their fall migration. And almost everybody that that I know that's planted it is uh, realizes that it attracts a lot of monarchs and it, uh, it and it actually is, it grows pretty well in most gardens. It's, it's not found that much yet. I haven't seen it in the nurseries at all. No. That's kind of strange. Yeah. A lot of these, yeah, that's, I'll probably talk about gardening a little bit at the end and, and that's an issue with availability of some of these because they're, they're, a lot of the seed availability is, is coming out of the upper Midwest and they don't, and, and there's some like this that are really special to the coast here. Okay, this one, red green, red green, milkweed, variegata. Uh, this is a kind of a piney woods, open pine oak uplands. So this is not a prairie species. Uh, I photographed this in Trinity County. I also photographed it in Arkansas. It's a really pretty milkweed, and it's it's in our it's been documented area in Liberty County. I wouldn't be surprised if you might be able to find it in Montgomery, up you know northern Montgomery County. Oh, it's, like up, it's up in San Luis. It's pretty common in that Sam Houston National Forest. Yeah. So this is one of, you know, for, for the Houston region, it's on the northern border. But it's a, and it's got really large leaves. You know, it stands up a three foot tall, opposite Ooh. leaves. You know, the flowers are kind of big, very hemispherical flower heads. But it just, you know, I've just, I've only encountered this this one time in our area, um, and that was out some, on one of the ranches that uh, I think the Katie Frick owns, and then that's this, this plant. But it, when you read about it, it's like East Saint is long, it's, this is one of these sand hills um, situations, short leaf pine, blue jack oak, or long leaf pine, blue jack oak, sand hills, the way that I guess in Savannah eco region. So it's it's probably you know it's a little it's probably the finest it's on the northern edge of our, our area. It's one of the it's there's some of them that are really highly associated with sand hill situations. And so there's once you get out into West Harris County, there's some really sandy areas out there. So it's clasping, or bluntly, it's a clasping milkweed. Uh, so the, the, the leaves sort of clasp around the stem. And the stem, you know, is, is whitish with a waxy surface. And the leaves are such a, you know, clasping the stem. I don't know, I found this description somewhere in the pedestals are strikers on one side and virus on the other side. So, I don't know. Never find one again. 
this is a very this to me this is a very interesting range is the Zizodes, Ornithorhodes, this uh, Asclepius Ornithorhodes, and I've seen it out in West Texas, and the range really rocky, you know, Edwards Plateau, High Plains, Rolling Plains, Grand Pecos, you know that's that doesn't seem like it would fit the Houston area, but in fact it somehow it does come in. To, I've seen it just on the west side of town, and I've seen it almost in town here. You know, like the little waterhole area, sort of, and um, you know, just on the southwest side of, of downtown, which I think is kind of funny. And then, but also apparently it occurs right on the practically the in Galveston, you know, on the base bay side, sort of in Galveston. He says, it's high, high sandy clay soils and dunes along the Texas coast. But in general, it's kind of a, it's a drier, you know, probably more accustomed to, you know, rocky situations. And so, but the Wildflower Center does say it's great for butterfly gardens, and it does seem to grow good. But if you have a butter, you know, if you want to do a garden, you know, you think of, you probably, you want to put this in some of the drier, you know, some dry situation where it's not too wet, probably. Um, it, I, and this was just on the west side of town once I photographed it. I mean, it, I've, I've not been able to create something like that in a garden yet, but I mean, it can get to be a pretty two foot wide, two foot tall type of plant with abundant flowers on it. And it's kind of unique in that the um, uh, hoods are really much longer than that big mass column in the middle. So here's, I mean, there's just a lot of milkweed. So uh, there's, this is the uh, longleaf milkweed, and it's Exclepius longifolia variety for health. There's also a variety longifolia. And there's some references that they treat them as separate species. I've not been able to figure out how you possibly can tell them apart. <laughs> um, but I'll get into that just a little bit. But um, it's sort of two feet tall, but a lot of times it's you'll see it kind of laying down rather than standing straight up. It's kind of laying down. And it has a lot of flower. You know, it, it produces a lot of flowers. And these. Um, Corollas are real, I mean, the petals are really, you know, pressed down on the pedestals and, and there's no horn, so, so it produces this, this sort of look, you know, it's easy to recognize. So this is the range that the, the, the Bada of North America project gives for her talk. And there's, so it, it's like our, you know, has, you know, the, our long folios have been identified as this her talk, which is common to the upper Midwest. But, you know, if you look at both of them, there's, there's all, this, this is kind of the range of the Longifolia, the variety of Longifolia, and this is the Hortella. And I think it should just be called, it should just be all, all one species myself. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, I have, and I've taken this picture, this is a picture from Arkansas, so it be, should be the same. And this is the only time I've really seen a seed pod mm. uh, for the Longifolia. Uh, I don't know why I haven't ever seen a seed, seed of here. I think Katie Inman says the same thing. She's never seen a seed pod before. And this is this is what I find interesting about this long This is this is like this is from uh, this guy Woodson, and in 1954 he um, he was he's the expert, you know, milkweeds, and he wrote. You know, describe every species and all sorts of details. Here's his, you know, here's his two ranges of the Hortella and the Longifolia. Well, and here's where he says I found. And he didn't even mention Texas really well. 
<laughs> and that's only a 54. And he basically, all the other ones, he you know, pretty much got it right. I mean, we have more records now that have come out. But why there were, there were not any records in this publication for long before we had I can't figure out. I don't know, if, is it expanded this range? I don't know. It's, it's like it just gets into maybe central, it's a couple records for Louisiana, and I don't, this hotel, I don't know, that's maybe southern Oklahoma. Um, you know, I realize this one, I, I took this picture in Oklahoma, and I, you know, I did I, up in, up, up here, that's where I took this picture, right? In, in the Hoggett Prey Preserve in Osage County, Oklahoma. And then I was looking, and I realized, well, there's this, where's this record for Harris County? And it's, and it, it's this, the Herbert record is for 1946, and it was three miles south of Hockley. Hmm. That's the Katy Fair. Mm -hmm. So I think we, every year, and I don't know, in June, July, we should organize a little bit to look for this Because <laughs> <laughs> this, it, actually, this it's three months is right at about Warren Lake. It is. <laughs> right. So, it's, um, it, you see, I don't know, Jason says, you know, like, the most recent collections were from 1925 to 54, was one from, and I guess he found one in 1999, but they're up, up, up here. So, I don't know. Is this a believable record? I, mean, I don't know why not, but I mean, at, at one time, you know, we had major Hoggrass Prairie all the way from here all the way to Winnipeg. So. And this is a classic Hoggrass Prairie species, I think. And the leaves are just really thin and really long, and the, the flowers are pretty unique, I think, because the, the hoods are kind of got the it's split with these the tip was deeply too low. Sometimes <coughs> they describe that as the hood having kind of horns, but it really doesn't. Um, and two other very similar species, I think there's some, some money here. Mm -hmm. so, this is, um, these are, you know, they can get, I mean, the, the Particulata and Linear, so the world is slim milkweed. And typically you find them and they're about the same size and they look very, very similar. The flowers are very similar. I think uh, Verticulata can get taller. I have seen it you know, three feet tall. Um, they're both really slender little plants, very slender. But um, the, the difference being that in Linearis, you have two leaves opposite, and a lot of times they're kind of just straight, like, and they're, lo and they're longer leaves. These are one to three and a half long, and this one generally less. And these leaves are whorled. They're three or four together in one spot. These are just so there's, there's not much difference between the two. Particulata is a wide-ranging species. It's found over a good part of the country. It, you know, a lot of different habitats. Blackland coastal, grand cross numbers, savannas, and, and and here in Houston area, you'll find it. Mm -hmm. If you find any good prairie remnant of any sort, you'll, you'll probably find it. is really it's endemic to Texas and it is usually found pretty close to the coast and sometimes it's just it, they, you know it's maybe associated with salt marsh transition but I've, I found it up almost at 16 too so I guess I haven't found this in uh, it's common along some of the 
roadsides in Chambers County. I've seen it in San Bernard National Wildlife Refuge. I guess it's at Nash Prairie List. So it's not that super uncommon, even though it's endemic to Texas. And like, wow. this is a patch in a, lot, a road in uh, Chambers County. And it's, it's, you know, if you catch it when it's blooming, you, you see that there's a lot of it, but you might drive by this same place a hundred other times <laughs> and you'll never notice it. And so I've seen it like this too at, down at um, San Bernard National Park Refuge driving around uh, Moccasin Pond one, one time. It was just as thick as it could be. And, and it's what's so neat is you get out and there's insects on every flower. So, our most common milkweed is, is what we generally refer to as green milkweed. The common names, you know, there's some, you know everybody uses them on common names, but it's the Fluffiest Veritas. And then there's this one that's pretty similar looking, Asperula, that's really found a little bit further west from here. And it's here because there was this record, and there's a herbarium, it's really a herbarium record for like Sheldon. I just have a hard time understanding it. And, um, so the difference is being, you know, like these, generally speaking, the leaves are really lanceolate, you know, really slender, and these are more oblong leaves. And a lot of times, the few times I've seen this, I'm really not that familiar with that through them, but it, it kind of tends like it lays down. Maybe a bigger plant. So Asperula, it's, it's, see, it's, it's really west. You know, it's really common <coughs> in the hill country and southern west Texas, I think. And but there is this one record for uh, it looks. I think it's what is now, you know, Sheldon State Park. And I don't know. It's and I think Dr. Brown is reporting it on his list now for Water County. But if you, you know, the habitat just doesn't fit very well with Houston, so, I mean, if, if you're going to plant a milkweed or, you know, the milkweed you're going to find is going to be this, this beer. It's, it's very, it's our most common milkweed, and you, you see it along all sorts of roadways. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, another difference is the Asperula, you know, is, Flower head is just where all the pedestals are right on the same point, and that's not the case with here as well. So this produces a very spherical flower head. And, and another thing is the petals for Veritas are longer, generally speaking, I guess. So, but for Asperula, the petals are not quite as long. So in this case, see, these big things are the, these bulbous hoods. Both of them have that, and they don't have the horns. Um, hmm. Green comet milkweed. It's a it's one that's you know found all over a large part of the country, and I have found it in different places around here. It's not very common, but you do find it in different different places around Houston. It is a, a prairie milkweed and savannas grassland. So it's a you know it's wide ranging. And often you'll see the stem zigzagging, but not always. Sometimes it's straight. And it has these sort of repressed these hoods that are kind of flat with no and so it doesn't have horns. And this is the flower fully open. It's not this bud, this is, you know, the flower doesn't get any open. Sea pods stand up, and another way to identify them, even if they're not flowering, is this, this there's a vein that tends to run continuously along the outside edge of the leaf, which is it's a little bit more continuous, and and so you can identify it that way sometimes if, if you're con maybe confusing with another. And then, uh, Pineland milkweed, Oluwata, I've seen it at, in Chambers County in a 
few spots, but not very many. Just and then I have seen it in West Harris County. It's also probably one that's a little like sandy, sandy condition. And it, it, and it, it can stand, it can stand at least two feet tall, if not taller sometimes, and it's got a really straight stem, really stout stem. With big, you know, big, you know, big flowers. There's some red ones, but for the open flowers. Yeah, it says, and it actually it does. It gives you this. Uh, it's kind of like it's fuzzy. It's soft. You know, but you best have to type. You know, to the stem and the leaves. <coughs> you see, yeah, you know, it's just sort of fuzzy. -like. Velvet. Looks like velvet. The leaves, this is over by the leaves, which, you know, I've, they can, it's, you know, it's very, this is like a young plant. So there's something about it that, you know, when you, it, even, even if it's only a few inches tall, you can sort of recognize it over the water. Okay, the, the few flower milkweed lancelata, this is uh, something. I've only seen it in Smith Point uh, in Chambers County. Um, wet coastal prairies and all these plants there. It's a, um, it's a gorgeous plant. I mean, it, it can stand. I mean, I think I've Fall and it's, it's just brilliant, brilliant red. And I don't know if there's any other place. I, I think um, I saw it on the U of H Coastal Center uh, plant list. I don't, I haven't seen it there, but that's the only other place I know of. Maybe somebody else knows about it. I don't, I, I don't think it exists in Brazoria County, or anybody knows where there's a population in Brazoria County. But it's just, you know, it's really a brilliant flower. And it, it is another one with really slender opposite leaves. Um, and it can stand up to four feet tall. I mean, you know, it's, but it, I guess it probably takes pretty special conditions for it. So, you know, gardening with it probably would be pretty difficult. And I think maybe the last one is uh, tuberosa. Butterfly milkweed, which is a very common, this is one that's very commonly sold. You can, you can buy it probably in mail order or seeds. Um, it's got, you know, it's wide, wide, wide ranging. And it's, you know, a lot of local gardeners haven't had much success with this wrap, but it did occur here. So, you know, I don't know, it may be that. We need to try to propagate the local populations that are adapted here. Um, it, it really likes pretty, it likes real sandy soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm not, and my experience is more Harris, Chambers County. I don't, I'm not very experienced with Liberty County or Montgomery County or Waller County. There may be. You know, there may be populations of it up there that I'm not aware of, but in Chambers County, I know of one spot, and in um, Houston, it still exists, apparently, at San Jose State Park. It's, in the, it's very dense, thick leaves. It's got a lot of leaves that really kind of highlight the flower, and it's very hairy. And this is the one, and it doesn't have any milky sap. It really attracts the uh, monarchs, I guess. We were just recently walking down by Buckland Bayou, and I guess since a lot of the new landscaping they've done there, they've planted a lot of these. Well, this is right there in Buckland Bayou. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize that what they've been doing there. You know, it's, it, that 
may be a situation where, you know, near a, a, a stream like that where it is sandy, you know, and it may be the right, it was kind of on a hillside. I mean, it could mm -hmm. be the right situation where a lot of those could really survive if it's, you know, if it's managed, you know, for the balls of the trees going there too, if they don't start <laughs> mowing or whatever. And this is actually, I guess, taken by any tip of the to some of them. This is some of the grave records I found for Harris County. So, like the real old one at Harrisburg. So, I mean, you know, like maybe it, it, it wants to get a curve along Buffalo Bayou. Uh, and it, you know, and it's 48 and 10 percent I guess it still survives there. And I get, and there's some, this is maybe someplace out not far from Sheldon State Park. So, you know, initially before I got into this, you know, I sort of said, well, it's, this, this plant's not supposed to be here. It's just too wet for it or whatever. You, you don't know what it was like 50 or 100 years ago. It might have been extremely abundant. And this, this is one that's so, you know, it, it's so pretty that this is one that people are going to go dig up. That's, you know. Uh, on the sand, along the San Jacinto River bottom, there's, you know, because there's so much abundance of sand, that you find it there. I don't know. It, I think I agree that it seems that some attract monarchs more than others. Mm. Like this one, I think, is really good for monarchs, probably. Uh, Rennes is really good. Uh, but I have seen monarchs on Viridis, but maybe when it's maybe a younger plant. Mm -hmm. So I, I, don't, I don't know exactly. I don't, I don't know of any studies where they try to associate, you know, which 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 are best for monarchs. You know, there's other, there's actually there's a lot of other plants in the same family that monarchs use too. So they don't use just milkweed. Uh, you know, I took this picture in Hogger's Prairie Preserve too, and this is kind of a quote from Whitson before remarking on how. You know, some of these milkweeds like tuberosa can be really old plants. They say like some of these plants, the, the, the plant could be 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And one, one rootstock could produce 50 stems. Well, this may be just one plant. I mean, I, I don't know what it would take to produce something like that in a garden. But. Okay, so I wanted to, I didn't, I wanted to, just to say a word or two about gardening. So I think we're all familiar with Calamies bringing nature home. And the, he, he gives you 112 reasons why you need to be gardening and landscaping with native plants. The next step is how do you do it? And I really think I've, I've encountered these two books just recently. And Planning a post all world and garden revolution. And I, I've read most of this one. I, I've just started reading this one, but they're basically both saying the same thing. It's like we need to create landscapes that are systems, um, that are functioning systems that, you know, and that rather than just an association of plants with mulch on you know, and, and if you do it right, you know, I know it's, it's a huge challenge, but if you do it right, you know, we're gonna, it, it's going to attract wildlife even better than planting separate native plants here and there. And it's going to, you're going to be able to manage it and not do maintenance. So, I mean, I mean, Ptolemy is endorsing both of these books big time. And um, you know, they're basically calling to task how we have been landscaping for years and years and years. Both of these guys are very, very experienced. And, and they're just saying, no, there's a, there's a better way to do this. And I like this quote, like, in contrast to the spirit of spontaneity of wild vegetation, the landscape of our yard, all park and city, some plastic assemblies, overused, evergreen, sheared into meatballs and fast. Sheared into meatballs. So, 
it's related populations. And it's, uh, you know, you, you got to think about a lot of different types of these these advocating where you have, um, you know, vertical layers. You know, and instead of mulch, you have plants to to to, to do the same thing. And and this guy is really saying the same thing. And so I think this is the next challenge is to try to create more landscapes along these lines. Even for the last line, a good book for weeding. So it's, it's accepting the weeds to some extent, but it's going in and just trying to continue to maybe cut the weeds instead of pulling them out, and also just keep planting good stuff and good stuff, and accept the system that's there, and, and not necessarily declare war on every single non-native plant. Yeah. So for gardening, with milkweeds. My only experience is that I think the Perennis is a good one, the Viridus is a good one. Uh, I think on Perodes should be considered. And and even like the Linearis and the Whorl milkweed, even though they're just they're not a lot to them, they should have their flight, they should easily survive in a, a milkweed patch if you do it. I mean I, I've been working at the a prairie garden at Mandel Park, and there's a linearis there. I don't even, I, don't, I didn't even plant it. So mm -hmm. it probably came in with something else. And so having those, and then tuberosa is still, it's kind of an experiment to see if we, you know, how can, can we propagate our local population and and use that in our, in our gardens. But in any case, you know, if you, if you want to put in a milkweed patch, you got to plant all. You got to plant a lot of other things with it because milkweed just can't sort of. They don't exist very well by themselves, so they need to be in a patch. Of, and you know, like, and here's some examples. You know, asters and coreopsis and and lovegrass and other grasses should be planted along with the milkweed. Uh, 